Good evening. Thank you very much, Adam, and thank you very much, Rick. I've been asked to talk about the future of SOZO from a clinician's perspective. And I think most of you know that I'm a radiation oncologist, and as such, I've been causing lymphedema for many years. But it's really been only in the last eight years since um, with Louise Colmai and Helen Mackey and um, uh, later Hiruswami and many others established the Alert Lymphedema Program. And um, it's amazing um, what I did not know as a radiation oncologist uh, before I started um, learning from all these um, very smart people around me. The, um, I'm also an author and I'm currently writing a book on um, life after breast cancer taking control. And um, the lymphatic system, of course, is complicated. It's, um, it, it's intricate. It's, it's um, perhaps one of the less researched areas um, in medicine. Um, but we know um, that when these small fine capillaries join the venules, you have this lymphatic system there, almost like a vacuum cleaner, um, picking up the pieces, um, uh, draining proteins and waste products and, and helping um, uh, almost be like a shock absorber to the surrounding tissue. And when it gets blocked, uh, these fine lymphatics um, uh, can easily become mal uh, uh, can malfunction after surgery or radi radiation therapy. And Professor Swami um, has done these beautiful studies showing the normal drainage of the breast in green, but when we look at the arm, most of it goes to the armpit, but this pink area here that I'll show later is the cephalic pathway, which drains um, up around the armpit to the infraclavicular and supraclavicular fossa. And indeed, when we... Uh, looked at um, a few hundred patients with um, who had an auxiliary dissection, we saw that uh, two thirds of the time patients still continue to drain to the axilla. Forty percent of the time they drained around this um, clavicular pathway uh, to the supraclavicular and infraclavicular fossa, and then uh, about one in ten drained to the parasternal area, and about one in twenty to the contralateral axilla and none um, to the inguinal area. And interestingly, if you read the paper, you'll see that as the stage of lymphedema increased, and particularly the advanced stage threes, um, the, there was more parasternal contralateral axillary uh, drainage, but still no inguinal drainage. Lymphedema has an enormous impact on patients and uh, regularly have patients, uh, uh, and I, a lot of you do in tears, um, saying that they can hide their mastectomy, they can hide this implant that's retracted after radiotherapy, um, uh, but they can't hide this um, garment that they have to wear. Um, and it's basically a daily reminder to themselves and to others around them and um, that they've had lymphedema. And, and, but obviously weight gain, self-esteem are all issues. And I, I won't be talking about, of course, breast edema, um, which is a topic for another day. What I will mention, however, is that uh, in this survey, partnering with the Breast Cancer Network Australia, Macquarie University School of um, Business, we um, discovered that lymphedema patients, patients with breast cancer and lymphedema, was like a double whammy. And um, for all these domains, work, career, family, social, self-image, um, feeling about self, um, were um, um, always worse in the, in the blue line for patients with lymphedema. What about radiation? Um, we don't know why some patients get lymphedema and others don't. Uh, in this um, paper from my colleague Alphonse Tagian, who's done some amazing work using the pyrometry, and, uh, and I had the, the pleasure of visiting him um, uh, and giving a, a brief lecture at their centre and looking and, and meeting their amazing staff. Um, uh, this very important paper um, showed that the peak lymphedema in incidence um, was six to 12 months over here for patients who had an auxiliary clearance. So this is the blue line, sharp increase in six to 12 months. But patients with central node biopsy, regional node recurrence was a lot later, 36 to 48 months. And um, you can see that um, when you look at these figures, 
the patients down the bottom here, 30% if you had radiotherapy to the superclav and axilla um, uh, developed lymphedema and 25% uh, with axillary dissection alone. But even patients who had a central node biopsy and radiotherapy um, to the axilla was up to 12%. So it's important to understand the radiotherapy fields, try and um, get some insight from your patient, um, ask them did they get a sore throat, um, which is one of the clues that they may have had superclavicular radiotherapy. Using old techniques, they often get a bit of sunburn um, just on their upper back. Um, and, and that's another clue that you can ask them. And um, this is a, a diagram from Professor Swami again, a, a paper recently published this year, the All But Forgotten Muscagny SAPI pathway. Uh, this is uh, in, in the setting of immediate lymphatic reconstruction using the lymph technique and uh, reconstructive surgery. And you can see that um, the cephalic vein um, goes into the level three supraclavicular region. And um, it's, it's likely that when we put on our radiotherapy superclavicular field, we are damaging this alternate pathway. So they're getting, the patient's getting a double whammy. They're getting the auxiliary pathway blocked with auxiliary dissection. And then um, the fluid may be draining um, the other way. And then we whack on the radiotherapy superclavicular field. But it's, um, it's a, a difficult area. Do we undertreat or potentially overtreat patients? But there's certainly patients who, um, uh, going to complete remission perhaps after neoadjuvant Herceptin that I may um, come off the supraclavicular field, but of course with informed consent. So what about the challenges for the radiation oncologist? Um, it's really my patient's challenges. They're getting variation in advice, advice about diagnosis of lymphedema um, and treatment of breast cancer. Access to therapists can be a problem. Being labelled as a lymphedema patient, you know, do we say to somebody um, at 7.2 they now have lymphedema, um, 6.9 they don't, um, do we call them subclinical lymphedema? And these are, um, as some of you know, that I have established screening programs, screening mammography um, in the past, and, and then we have the same issue that we have a technique that we... Um, screen everywhere, mobile vans, in shopping centres and what have you. And then if there's an abnormality, um, we trigger them, uh, we assess them, and then if they have early breast cancer, we treat them. But for some of these patients, they have ductal carcinoma in situ. It's pre-cancer. It's not quite cancer, um, but we have that word cancer in the, in the word ductal carcinoma in situ, subclinical lymphedema. And, and we've got to be very careful with our language and not to frighten patients. And... And, get, and obviously give them hope that by detecting it early, um, we can prevent it from, um, from occurring. Of course, there's patronising comments. Um, you still hear it today. Um, look, we've cured you. Um, it's a small, lymphedema is a small price to pay for your disease. Prevention of cellulitis, frequency of measuring lymphedema, um, weight management, and dealing with some of the myths, you, you know, can I have a blood pressure on injection or can I fly and so on. But the reality is um, this week I, I saw three patients um, struggling. Um, uh, one had lymphedema, two didn't, but there's a whole range of other issues that our, uh, our patients are dealing with, coping with the ups and downs, fear of recurrence, weight gain, sexuality. They're, they're, I'm not gonna read them all out. And lymphedema prevention and treatment is just one of many issues that we have to deal with. And it's often difficult um, as, as doctors in a busy clinic um, bring some of these issues up and um, one of my patients said to me yesterday um, um, you, you know one of the few doctors that I, who listens to me listens to my concerns and and I think this is where therapists have an important role to play to move um, transition from lymphedema into exercise and other survivorship issues and um, for the practitioners, um, lymphedema therapists, uh, supporting preoperative access to get a baseline, uh, how often do you screen them, or how do you fit this in into your busy week when you're trying to do MLD and laser and kinesiology and a whole lot of other things. Um, uh, understanding radiotherapy, we've mentioned um, treatment after pathological complete remission, can we um, adjust our radiation therapy? And of course, um, I did not know until 2012 that as lymphedema progresses, it deposits fat and fibrosis and 
And really, in fact, your LDEX measurements can in fact come down as there's less fluid, but more um, scarring and more fat um, when we introduce treatments such as liposuction. So the future direction, um, uh, obviously, uh, test, trigger, treat is, is a really simple approach that impediment has come up with, which I really do like. Um, get a baseline if you can, uh, screen regularly, and if it goes over 6.5, intervene. And certainly that's what I'm doing for my patients. Um, and my patients do like looking at their charts and um, uh, these longitudinal measures and, and, and empowering them. And I think SOSA and LDX empowers the patient. Um, and, and in fact, sometimes... Um, they realise it's not as bad as what they think when they're, they're getting some symptoms. But there is a, a relationship between patients getting symptoms and the onset of abnormal LDEX. And I think I would rather have an abnormal in this particular patient. Um, it used to be over 10 would be um, self-report was a bit later, volume was a bit later. And um, uh, and you can see the difference between LDEX and volume is, is about eight months. The... Um, when you look at a pre-surgical baseline here, minus 4.41, um, we see a change occurring six and a half here. We would have intervened, um, in my estimate is 22 months earlier. So this is the, um, the challenge. Um, um, do we wait for instruments like um, my clunky tape measure um, inspection when I'm busy rather than getting the tape measure out? Pyrometry, or do I rely on a, on a, on a more sensitive instrument like Eldex? And um, I'd rather pick up, particularly my radiotherapy patients where the lymphedema is occurring late, um, pick it up earlier um, using Eldex and SOSA. But is this all smoke and mirrors? Um, you know, can a compression garment really help? Um, and I know I'm uh, teaching uh, bridges are converted here, but I, I, I was really interested in this study, which was an ICG study. Um, you know, on the left here, you can see linear um, is the normal flow, splash is maybe a bit dysfunctional, and you can see stardust where it's becoming a, um, a, 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 you know damaged lymphatics from bridging and dermal backflow, diffuse when there's a lot of dermal backflow and, and the lymphatics are totally disrupted and no flow at all. But you can see um, 196 patients before surgery had the ICG that there was a little bit of splash in 24 patients uh, even before surgery. And maybe this is the future of picking up patients um, uh, before um, we um, before they have their surgery. And maybe this combination of ICG and LDEX may give us clues as to which patients um, we, we really need to intervene with compression garment pretty quickly after surgery. And you can see 35 patients here went into these orange and red and purple zones. And, and the protocol was if you develop stardust and, and diffuse on ICG, then you had compression therapy. And um, interestingly, 11 um, of 35, about a third of these patients had reversal of their changes with the therapy that you provide each and every day with compression garment and so that can be integrated. As an example, uh, this is a study uh, I did with um, uh, Professor Carolyn E from University of Western Sydney um, where we surveyed uh, patients from the BCNA, cross-sectional survey. We found that the mean self-reported weight at diagnosis for patients with breast cancer related lymphedema was 74 kilograms versus 68 kilograms. So um, this is not new, but it's, in, it's an important Australian finding. Um, so if we see a patient who's overweight, we know that we really should be thinking about these patients, not only monitoring, perhaps even treatment, modifying our treatments, perhaps uh, erring more towards central node biopsy and radiotherapy than auxiliary dissection. We know that 51% um, of patients were overweight or obese with a BMI of over 25 compared to 35% uh, of women without breast cancer related lymphedema. And if you had breast cancer related lymphedema, you were more likely to gain weight. Um, uh, and this was significantly different. Um, and you're more likely to be currently overweight or obese and less active. And, um, and I um, call this paper Weight Gain and Lymphedema. Uh, after breast cancer treatment, avoiding the catch-22. It's a real catch-22 that overweight patients get more lymphedema and uh, patients with lymphedema gain more weight. And what we did find in a qualitative analysis is that having a, a structured exercise program, following a prescribed diet um, and being accountable to someone else um, 
were some of the main facilitators to a successful weight loss program. And I would argue that integrating SOZO and, and the graphs and the feedback um, will be very important. And, and these are obviously some of the new outputs that, um, of tissue analysis which can be integrated. So final couple of slides, current model of care, um, test, trigger, treat. Um, I would like to encourage all of you to think of a broader model of care. And I have um, uh, said this to Rick Carrion over a coffee or a glass of wine occasionally, when he, um, occasionally when I've met him when he's been out in Australia, is that, um, you know, go back to the blood pressure model. We, we, um, we have to go to the blood pressure, to the doctor to get, our blood pressure checked. Um, we um, then um, could go to the chemist and get your blood pressure checked, and then we could go um, and, and have our own uh, equipment at home to get our blood pressure checked. So I would argue that lymphedema screening using SOSA should happen everywhere. It should happen at the chemist, at the therapist, at home, at the doctor, at the radiotherapy department. Um, increase the screening like we did with mammographic screening and, and get it um, into the shopping centres. That, of course, should be monitored by a uh, therapist. And that therapist, um, uh, once um, the number is abnormal, should see that patient. And um, that accredited therapist should not just be looking at lymphedema, but looking at their exercise, their diet, menopause, sexuality, body image. I'm not saying alone, but in combination with their GP, the doctor, um, other therapists, psychologists, and, and exercise physiologists. Um, more sophisticated tests should occur with the accredited therapist, not just the SOSA. It might be the moisture meter, it might be uh, interpreting body composition, uh, referring or doing ICG, or um, looking at their shoulder, breast edema, pyrometry, and then intervening with um, ICG directed SLD, um, uh, all the other. Um, uh, uh, conservative treatments that you, you know uh, a lot more about than I do and of course understanding when early surgery should be done with LVA, lymphovascular anastomosis or lymph node transfer or when to intervene, when to say look I can't do any more uh, because of the fatty fibrosis and intervene with liposuction and maybe one day uh, medication. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and, and thanks once again to Impediment uh, for your very kind invitation.